Good morning, church family. It is so good to be here to see you this morning. Uh, my name is Garrett McCord. I'm the youth pastor here at FBC Bernie, and it's good to be back up here on a Sunday morning. It's, it's been a while, and part of the reason it's been a while is that my wife and I had our firstborn in July. Here's a picture of her, if they've got that up there. There we go. Had to butter y'all up with a baby picture before we get started this morning, right? Uh, but she's sweet. She's a happy baby. Uh, but the last three months have been figuring that out, right? <laughs> I'm the youngest sibling. I'm one of the youngest cousins, so I have like no frame of reference. I always used to joke with Christine, like I have no like frame for child development. Like I look at a kid, you could be six months old, six years old. I have no idea. Like I just don't, I didn't get to witness that, right? And so I I will say though, even though I didn't really know what was going on, especially in like one area was labor and delivery, I had no idea what to expect, right? Absolutely none. I will say though, and, and I hope Christine would agree with this. I I think I did a fairly good job, right? I didn't faint. Like, I I was good. The one area where I tripped up a little bit was the epidural, right? Uh, And and so let me explain. Basically, we were loading up the buses for camp, right? We were going to Cairo. We knew that we weren't going to go to Cairo. She was actually past her due date at that point. And she, um, we loaded up the buses. We got them off. We went home, noticed hey, she's not, Leighton's not moving around as much, went to the hospital, found out she's already in labor. So we get up into our room and they start asking us and, and talking to us. It's like, hey, you know, are you gonna want an epidural? And she goes, duh. I'm like, okay, great. We're gonna get that scheduled. But they tell us, hey, that's awesome. The, the one thing to keep in mind, just a suggestion, like you should really get your ep- epidural before 6 a.m. Because the doctor who's on call right now is amazing. He's wonderful. Like, like he's really the one you want. And I'm like, okay, like, like cool. But, but who comes after 6 a.m.? Like, is that the JV, like B team? Like, this is a pretty big deal. Like, I, I don't want the backup here, right? Like, I want the, so we made sure to schedule it before 6 a.m. And so uh, time goes by and, and the guy comes in, the doctor comes in with all the stuff he needs. And I'm starting to get a little bit queasy, like in my stomach. One, because I saw the needle. And, and let me tell you, that's not a needle. That's a PVC pipe somebody sharpened at one end. <laughs> that is ridiculous. Like, we have the technology. Figure out how to shrink that thing. That's, ooh. Right, and so that started, and then like the smell of like the iodine or whatever, that chemical that like cleanses the injection spot. And then he starts to explain to me and give this long spiel or explain it to Christine. And he's like, hey, um, it's very important that you don't move, right? Because it's going in your spinal column. We don't want to like mess anything up in there. And he says, hey, just in case I miss, which for the record, I didn't know was an option. I, I thought, <laughs> like, I just thought that was pretty sure and like set in stone, right? We're gonna figure this out. And so he's like, hey, just in case I miss, if you taste anything funny like metal or if you, um, you know, start to go numb anywhere, like make sure you say something so we know what's going on. I'm like, wow, I'm really glad we did this before 6 a.m., right? And so I'm starting to get a little bit nervous here because uh, she's also having contractions in the middle of this. And so I'm like, well, what if she moves and messes it up? And so I'm kind of freaking out. And I think the nurse notices. I don't know why. Like I thought I looked pretty calm, cool, and collected, but apparently... I was like really like very visibly kind of shaken. And so she's like, hey, 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 calm down, right? Breathe, it's gonna be okay. Doctor, I think his name was Dr. Lee. I don't even remember, but the doctor's awesome. He's done this a million times. Have some faith in him and he's gonna take care of your wife. He's gonna help ease your pain. It's all gonna be good. And so I'm sitting there. I think I'm the only one who used all the breathing exercises. I'm like doing the... (laughs) <laughs> doing it wow, the breathing. Um, and so I'm calming down, I'm trying to, and, and I finally get a little bit calm. They, they do the injections, she starts feeling better. And of course, everything goes smoothly and it's fine. Uh, and then we have our beautiful baby girl a couple hours later. But that experience caused me to reflect, as, as crazy as it sounds, a little bit on faith, right? Because I was being asked to put faith in a guy who I had never met to jab a PVC pipe of a needle into my wife's spinal column and just make everything go okay. And it was a little bit difficult, if I'm being real, right? That takes a lot of faith. And I thought back to my faith in God, and I realized, hey, if we're honest, sometimes so is having faith in God, right? We sometimes just take this idea of faith in God for granted, and we hear a lot about it in church. But the truth is, we struggle sometimes to put faith in what we can see, right? The visible things, in the stuff of everyday life, how much more difficult is it sometimes to place faith in the God that we can't visually, physically see? And our natural inclination is to be skeptical. 
We, we are broken, fallen people in a broken and fallen world, and the world doesn't make it any easier, right? You open up the news app or any sort of news channel, and the first things you're gonna hear about is war, genocide, the crashing stock market, crashing housing market. And, and it, makes it, it makes it really hard to have this positive outlook, much less faith. And, and then some of the institutions and people that we've grown so accustomed to being able to place faith in, such as uh, the government or, or spiritual leaders, have fallen and have shaken the faith of thousands. And, and so there's this reality that we live in a world that at first glance isn't very conducive to having faith. And, it, and it's easy to doubt God. It's easy to question God. How can faith survive in that type of world? It can. And, and I hope to show you this morning that not only can faith survive, not only can faith thrive in the world and society that we live in today, but it's absolutely necessary to persevere through the situations we face today in the world that we live in today. And if you've been with us these past few weeks, we have been walking through the book of Acts and, and it's been this amazing journey. We've seen Jesus commission the disciples. He's told them, hey, you're gonna go make more disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then you see the disciples in the upper room, the Holy Spirit falls on Pentecost and they are empowered to go live out that great commission. All these uh, apostles who at once were shy and scared and frightful now are these confident, literally living temples and we've walked through the significance of that and they're going and now Peter preaches the gospel to a crowd on the day of Pentecost and we see thousands saved. And so now we've arrived to Acts chapter three. And so if you would, go ahead and grab your Bible, open up to that spot, Acts chapter three, verse one. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the pew rack in front of you. That is yours to keep. Take it, mark it up, make it yours. We want you to have a copy of God's word. And I also wanna say, as you're flipping there, that we have the privilege this morning of taking the Lord's Supper. And so there should have been some baskets with them when you walked in, but if you did not get the elements, there's gonna be some deacons who are gonna stand up right now and see if there's anybody who needs them. So guys, if y'all don't mind seeing, if you just slip up your hand, if you don't have the elements, um, and y'all make sure they get some, thank you very much. And I do want to say, hey, the Lord's Supper is for believers. And I wanna ask that, you know, we, we want to start preparing our hearts now we don't ever wanna take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. We don't want it to just be an afterthought. So even now, as we move through this text and we start moving through what I think God has to show us this morning, just be rolling that over in your mind and your heart that that is where we're moving. And the final thing, I know I have like a laundry list before we get to the text, but it's gonna look a little bit different. We're gonna walk through the text and we're gonna stop at points and we're gonna walk through the details because it's a pretty big chunk. And then we're gonna move to some of the application points there at the end. So I'm gonna pray real fast and then we're gonna jump into the word, all right? Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your word this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to get to, God, witness how you moved in the early church and how you brought people to yourself. And Father, I pray that right now we could remove all the distractions, all the busyness, all the hurry, the, the wandering of mind and thoughts, and we could just give you all of our attention in our hearts right now because you're worthy of it, Father. And we want to experience you because we know that when you show up and when you move, we leave different. We leave better. We leave more like Jesus. And I pray that would be the reality this morning. Father, we love and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And so I'm gonna start in verse one. It says, now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. And a man who had been unable to walk from birth was being carried, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. And this was in order that he would beg for charitable gifts from those entering the temple grounds. And when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple grounds, he began asking to receive a charitable gift. And so here you have, I'm gonna pause right there. Here you have Peter and John walking into the temple. And this is something that actually probably happened fairly regularly. This was before tensions between the Jewish authorities and Christians had risen to a level of where, hey, there's a lot of persecution going on. Um, the, the believers that actually still meet like outside of synagogues and in the outer court of the temple. And so this was pretty regular. But as they were walking in, they pass a man who scripture says has been unable to walk since birth. And later in Acts, like Acts chapter four, which we'll get to next week, they, we find out this guy's actually 40 years old. So he's been here a while. This is something, this isn't new for him. This has been his life. And he's, we also learned that there's been, either it's a group of friends or family or somebody has been bringing this man to this temple gate every single day for who knows how many years, 25, 30. 
and it's so that he can beg. And mind you, it's not random that this is where he goes either. He's going to the temple gate on purpose because he is catching all the people who are going in to give offerings, to pray. Like he knows his audience. He's just giving them an opportunity to be generous, right? He's trying to catch some spiritually charged up people so that he can get um, maybe a little bit of what they were gonna give for their offering. And this guy sees Peter and John and he begins the same words that he said over and over and over again every day for the past 25 years some effect of, hey, any change, you have anything you can spare, I need some money. But he didn't get the response that he expected as we see in verse four. It says, but Peter, along with John, looked at him intently and said, look at us. And they gave, or he gave them theirs to his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not have silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk. And grasping him by the right hand, he raised him up and immediately his feet and ankles were strengthened. And so this guy's just going through his regular routine, asking everybody, hey, any change, any change, any change. But Peter stops and he looks at him in the eye and it catches him off guard because think about how these interactions normally go, even today. Honestly, it's usually avoiding eye contact, just going as fast as you can to get past But that's not what happens here. Not only does Peter make eye contact with him, but he says, hey, 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 look at me. And now all of a sudden this interaction that was this kind of transactional, hey, give me money and I'll leave you alone type of deal is now a genuine meeting. It's a genuine, there's actual humanity in this conversation now. And and while this guy's expecting some sort of handout, Peter flips the script and he says, hey, I don't have any silver or gold to give you. See, Peter's pretty relatable here, right? It's like, "I I don't have any money, man. But what I do have to you, what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. And the text says that Peter grabbed him by the hand and he picked him up and Luke, the doctor who writes Acts, of course, is interested in the medical component of this. And he says that his feet and his ankles were immediately strengthened. This is not how this man expected this interaction to go. He was hoping at best for a couple of coins and now he can all of a sudden walk something he's never experienced before. And you can actually see this in his reaction in verse eight. He says, and leaping up, he stood and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they recognized him as being the very one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg for charitable gifts. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And if you can, try to put yourself in this man's shoes. 40 years He hasn't ever known what it feels like to walk or stand or run or even be able to go anywhere without having to have someone help him and the feeling of being a burden. And all of a sudden, in a moment, everything changes. He, 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 he gets pulled up and he, he leaps up and he's now walking, running, standing all at the same time. He's like going crazy because he doesn't know what to do. And the text says, <laughs> that he started to praise God. And, and that's pretty significant. And, and I, wanna, I wanna proceed with caution here because I am filling in some lines, but I don't think it's a stretch. Because think about this, man. He's in Jerusalem, he's at the temple. He's probably born a Jew, raised up in, in that faith. He, he has some sort of experience with the things of God. And, and, and I'd have to imagine with not being able to walk for 40 years, he probably had some hard moments in his relationship with God, if there was a relationship there at all. I don't think it's a stretch to imagine that between nearly 40 years of being unable to walk that there was some anger, some bitterness, some frustration. God, why me? Why why me? Even from birth, why would you let this happen to me, God? I can't have a family, I can't provide, I can't do it. Why would you let this happen? Yet in one moment, The name of Jesus made everything whole. And he knew no reaction except to jump up and praise the Lord. All that bitterness, all that anger, all that perceived, hey, God just forgot about me, washes away in a moment. He sees God for who he is. He knows that, hey, God sees him and he begins to praise the Lord. And the text actually points out that those around him noticed this and they were astonished to see him up and walking around. And that's not just because, hey, you know, why is this guy jumping in the temple? It's because they knew this guy. He'd been sitting here for 30 years 
And they've never seen him been able to walk, been able to do anything. And now all of a sudden he's running around clinging to Peter and John. And so they're just confounded at what in the world just happened. And they're so amazed, they actually come and they start to investigate the situation in verse 11. It says, while he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the portico named Solomon's, completely astonished. And so now this group is starting to form under uh, Solomon's portico. And, and the reason the whole Solomon's portico thing is important is ironically, probably about six months before this happened, Jesus was actually standing in this exact spot in John chapter 10, teaching. And so now Peter, this, this group is gathered up again right in this very spot and Peter sees the opportunity and he begins to preach again. And he just straight up shares the gospel. It, it sounds very similar to his sermon that we heard a couple of weeks ago of, hey, you know, you've seen this man, Jesus. God glorified him, yet you killed him. However, God raised him on the third day. And, and he begins the very same way, but when he gets towards the end after he presents the gospel, he adds a twist. In verse 16, he says, and on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health and presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance just as your rulers did, but the things which God previously announced by the mouths of all the prophets that as Christ would suffer, he has fulfilled this way. And therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ, the, or Jesus, the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouths of his holy prophets from ancient times. And so here, Peter's been sharing the gospel and now all of a sudden he pivots back to the point of the miracle. Why did this miracle happen? What is the purpose? It's not random. God had a purpose for this happening in this time, in this place to these people. And he says, hey, this miracle, it is by faith in the name of Jesus that this man was healed. That, that is what healed this man. It wasn't me, Peter. It wasn't him, John. It wasn't some magical mystical. It was the name of Jesus that healed this man. And it happened here in front of you so you would know that the power of the name of Jesus brings healing and life and restoration. Amen. The miracle provided these people a chance to repent. And Peter calls them, hey, repent and return. And he gives three things that will happen. He says, one, so that your sins would be wiped away. Two, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And three, that God would send Christ, which is possibly an allusion to the second coming. And there's a lot there that we don't have time to unpack this morning. And Peter ends this sermon by pointing out that Moses, the prophets, and Abraham, all of these, this great cloud of witnesses pointed to this fact that there is power in the name of Jesus and that faith in that name brings healing, brings life. It's all pointed to that central truth. And really, through and through, this whole account and this whole story of this miracle is full of the gospel. Peter preaches it. He explains, hey, this whole miracle was proof of the gospel. It was a picture of that and the healing of a man. And then he says, hey, there's all of this evidence. If that wasn't enough, all the people that you rely on point to Jesus, talking to the Jews. God really went to some great lengths here to offer salvation. And that brings me to one of the two main landing spots I think we can see in this text. One is that at the core, this whole miracle is a beautiful picture of God's grace. Because don't forget, and let me walk this out and explain that a little bit. I know that sounds okay, yeah, that makes sense. But let me explain. I don't think we realize how big of a deal this is at first. All of this happened in the temple, Solomon's portico. And, and you know, I mentioned earlier that Jesus spoke in Solomon's portico about six months before this. You know how that interaction ended? The authorities tried to stone him. And, and not only that, but those same authorities are here in the temple. They're the ones who see this miracle. And they were the ones who just weeks before this killed Jesus. But here God is making an undeniable miracle happen right in front of those people. Undeniable. They all knew this guy. They knew he couldn't walk and now they're watching him jump around. The very same people who crucified him, who were in the crowd, who called for Barabbas, now God 
is doing a miracle. Why? So that they could have an opportunity to repent. So that they would repent and believe that they would see the life that comes, like we just said in that miracle, the life that comes through faith in Jesus' name. That's mercy. That's God's grace. Think about the man who was healed. He didn't seek God. He didn't have any faith. He didn't even mention the name of Jesus. Unlike so many of Jesus' healings in the gospel where they knew about Jesus and so they found him and they sought him and they tried to, hey, I have faith in you. Would you please heal my son? Would you please do this or please do that? And, and he granted it. This guy had no clue what was going on. He just wanted money. He just wanted money and God chose to empower Peter and John through the Holy Spirit to heal him. It wasn't a random miracle, right? Peter didn't just say, ah, this guy looks like he's worth a healing and sprinkle some like magical fairy dust. No, this was intentional. This man who wanted nothing to do with God seemingly was intentionally chosen for this healing. And so you, you start to look at all the players in this story and you quickly realize, hey, none of these guys deserve all this mercy that God's given out. None of these guys deserve this grace. Like they're all guilty. They wanted nothing to do with God, but God for some reason just shows up and says, boom, I'm gonna change your life. And we can be so quick to dog on the people in this story. The Jewish authorities are very often kind of this like proverbial pastoral punching bag. Like we love to throw stones at them and I'm not saying that they're innocent, but I think we often forget that we, we have been in the same boat. Just like them, before God's grace showed up, for every single one of you sitting here, and myself included, who's a believer, before God's grace showed up, we were just as evil. We were just as ignorant. And it reminds me of a story uh, from when Christine worked for a swim company a while back when we first moved here. And she was the program director of the swim company, so she kind of did a little bit of everything, but one thing she was in charge of was staffing. And so, <coughs> sorry, being a swim company, they get a lot of kids who would apply to be swim coaches who hadn't done a whole lot of like job searching or um, maybe hadn't done a whole lot of resumes. And so um, kind of what you'd expect, there were some pretty funny things that got put on those resumes under the accomplishment sections. And so of course I made a list of a few of these things just because it cracked me up and I was like, I'm going to use that for a sermon one day. I don't know how, but I'm gonna make sure and so uh, just to list a few of them, one put has a driver's license. Okay, you know, it's good. Not everybody has a driver's license. That's great. Um, another put homecoming king. All right, you know, like, you know, it probably meant something to somebody. There's only one of those per school. That's cool. Uh, another one, and I don't even know what this is, said red rosette for baked goods at the county fair. That might be a big deal. I have no idea. It's not a blue ribbon. It's a red ribbon, but it's something, right? I didn't. That may be a huge deal to somebody. Uh, another just put honorable mention football. Like not honorable mention MVP, not honorable mention like all, like first offense, like just honorable mention football. Like I almost made the team. Like they said, you tried really hard. They were proud of me when they told me that I wasn't gonna be on the team. And then finally, my favorite one, uh, it literally just said, I'm not kidding you. I, I just literally copied and pasted it. It said talking 10 plus years. It's great, it's a prereq for pretty much any job ever, right? And so I don't wanna make light of anybody. I, you know, these kids probably meant well, they just really wanted this job. But the point here is, that's what our resume looks like when we compare it to the perfect holy standard that God has. Right, that's as silly as our resume looks when we try to play this whole works righteousness game. Scripture's clear that God is perfect and holy and that he hates sin. Because he is perfect, he has to punish sin. He has wrath against sin. And, and the, you know, that sounds, oh yeah, good. We want God to punish evil. But the problem is, on our own, we're evil. Right? We're full of sin. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, and honestly, if we look around our world, we know this. right? You go on 16.04 at 5 p.m., you're gonna see the depravity of man. <laughs> I'm telling you, you'll see it in yourself, too. There's been a lot of confessional prayers said after I exit that highway. And Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. And Peter, at the end of the sermon where I kind of summarized it, he actually says that for those who ignore this message of the gospel that I just shared, they will be destroyed. But if you look at John 3.16 through 18, we all know, hey, for God so loved the world, right? But at the end of that, he says that Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save it because the world's already condemned. 
It's not like God has this newfound spite for humanity now that Jesus came. He's like, hey, you guys were already on a highway to somewhere not great, right? Like y'all were already running headlong away from God and now Jesus shows up to offer salvation and grace and mercy. And we know this, we might know these answers that we fall so helplessly short of God's standard and perfection, but if you ask a professing Christian, you, you do ministry long enough, you get to experience this, if you ask somebody who professes to be a Christian, hey, hey, why is God gonna let you into heaven? A lot of time you'll get answers of, oh, well, I read my Bible, I served, I, I really, you know, I, I did some faithful work in kids' care. But all of that on its own is no better than a red rosette to cover our sins. It's no better than a driver's license or talking 10 plus years. But the point here, I, I, I'm not sitting here trying to hammer you down with a Bible. My, my goal is not to leave you feeling guilty or shameful. The whole point of this is to have you in awe of the love and mercy and grace of God. That despite all of that sin, all of that muck, all of that mire, God knows your sin more than you do. The most ashamed that you've ever been, the most fearful you've ever been of your sin, God understands that sin deeper than you did. It offends him more than it offended you, yet he loved you. Yet he offered grace, he offered mercy. And that's what I, I would want you guys to see, that we're just like the man who was healed. Before Jesus, we didn't desire him. We, we, before he showed himself to us, before he captured our hearts, we didn't want anything to do with him. I, I look at my own life. I was running in the opposite direction before he grabbed me and yanked me back. Even though we didn't do anything to earn it, he sent his son Jesus to bear the wrath and punishment for our sin that we earned, that we stored up so that we can have his account, that we can be free, that we can be his children, we can be adopted, loved, redeemed in Christ if we would place our faith in his name. The people in this miracle did nothing, yet God healed them, offered them repentance. And just like that, we've, we've done nothing to earn our salvation, to earn God's grace, but yet in his love and his mercy, he offers it to us freely. To be healed of the disease of sin and receive eternal life from faith in Jesus's name. But that does bring me to, to my second point and the second thing I think we can learn and apply from this scripture this morning. And that's that while faith is necessary for salvation, it shouldn't be limited to conversion. And, and let me explain a little bit what I mean by that. We often view faith as this mechanism by which we're saved, by grace through faith. And that is absolutely true, 100 billion percent. But it's more than that we sometimes limit this idea of faith to this checkbox that gets us in the door and then we just kind of forget about it. But to do that is to rob yourself of the life that God has in store for you, to rob yourself of God's best for you because faith isn't this one-time thing. If you look back at what Peter says in our passage, verse 19, he says, therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And obviously there's a salvation component there but there's also a daily component of faith. He says times of refreshing, it's plural. He's not just talking about when we end up in eternity one day in the new heaven, the new earth, and we're with him. He said there's times of refreshing. He's talking about the daily faith in Jesus's name that provides daily refreshing. And to show you what this looks like, I, I was trying to come up with an illustration for this, and I just couldn't. And I realized what better way than, than how I've seen this in my own life because I placed my faith in Jesus when I was young and I knew that, hey, there's nothing that is gonna save me from my sins except the blood of Jesus. Got that check done, I've got it, I'm good. And in the moment, <coughs> sorry, I thought that was the end, right? I thought that, hey, you know, I'm good, everything's gonna be hunky-dory for the rest of life. I was wrong because I needed faith to overcome all of my childhood fears, storms, height, death, abandonment. I needed faith to overcome the sin and the addiction that had taken hold of my life before I even realized it was wrong. I needed faith to make a decision on where I would go to school, on committing to ministry. I needed faith on where to serve in ministry in the middle of a pandemic and try to, try to provide for a family. I needed faith to navigate being a husband and a father when I had no idea what I was doing. And that's barely scratching the surface. 
I could go on and on and on about the areas and the seasons in my life where it has required copious amounts of faith. And it's not just me. Every single one of you can probably relate to that in some way, shape, or form. We all have this mountaintop experience when we get saved, but then we realize, hey, the Christian life is this mountainous valleys and hills where you have these great moments and then you have these moments in these valleys. And we can so often think that, hey, it's all about trying to be on as many mountaintops as possible until you mature in your faith and you realize that it's in the valley where God teaches you to have faith. It's not this one-time event that its only purpose is to get us in the door. It's needed for every stage of life, all the trials, all the joys. And if placing faith in Jesus to be saved is, hey God, I trust that Jesus' blood is enough to cleanse me of my sin. There's no other way I'm placing my faith that I know that what's gonna get me into heaven day is the fact that Jesus died on my account. Then daily faith looks like, hey God, I trust that you're gonna help me walk out of this sin. I trust that you're gonna make the financials of the situation work out. I trust that my value is in you. I am who you say I am, not in what people think about me. I trust that my value, God, is more than my relationship status or, or my, my work, my career. I trust God in whatever that situation is saying, I trust you. And if you will, I promise that God will show up in that situation. I know that he did it for me. He freed me from those fears, that sin. He led me to the right school. He led me here. And, and by his mercy, he has been my sustainer in, in fatherhood and marriage. And he will do the same for you. And I know that's a big promise, but that's God's big promise. It's not mine. That's straight from his word. There's an author named Erwin Lutzer who wrote, faith is only as good as the object in which it is placed. So you can trust that your faith will be effective. You can trust that, hey, if I place faith in Jesus' name, he'll show up because he's already showed up in the biggest way possible on the cross. If he can bring about salvation from the death of his son at the hands of evil men, then he can bring about life and refreshing in whatever you're going through this morning. I promise. And I will have to, I do have to say that doesn't always look like we think it will. There's a theological movement today that says, hey, God will always provide physical healing because that's his will. You just have to have enough faith. And if you don't experience that feeling, you just need more faith. That is not what I'm saying this morning. That's false teaching. But I will say that God will show up. He might not provide physical healing. He might bring emotional healing. He might bring mental healing, relational healing, spiritual healing, which is actually our highest need. That's where we get that wrong. We sometimes think, hey, physical healing is what I need. Hey, the death rate is still 100%, guys. You'll be physically healed. You're still gonna meet your creator one day. And so in light of that, what's our highest need? It's spiritual healing. God promises that. He's a good father. He knows what his children need. And he's always gonna provide that because he loves to, he cares about you. He will discipline you well. And we sometimes bristle at that word discipline because we may have images of how our parents disciplined us, sometimes out of frustration, sometimes out of anger. That's not how God disciplines if you would put faith in his name, you'll experience healing. The issue here is sometimes, we, we as believers, we usually think we're pretty good in this area. We don't think this is something we struggle with. We don't easily realize when we have misplaced our faith in day-to-day -day life. It's not something that we just knowingly do. But it's usually this gradual fade into placing our faith in some lesser thing. We start on fire for the Lord when we get saved, but when the road bumps of life start happening, we start to return to those old ways. Like, hey, Jesus, I really appreciate you saving me. That's great. Like, I know you did that for me. Awesome, but I've got it from here. Like, I'm gonna take the wheel. Like, I got this. Like, I'm good. So to those in the middle of a trial or a hardship this morning, or just life, let me ask you, where is your faith this morning? Is it in the name of Jesus? Or is it in your name? Your ability to handle it all, to organize everything, to keep everything together. Maybe it's in your bank account, all the financial hedges you've set up to protect yourself from life and vulnerability. It's the issue with money, it lets us play God. Protect us from feeling like we need anybody. 
your ability to hide or run from anything that makes you discomfortable. That's where I'm at, right? I don't like to feel sad. I don't like to feel anxious. I'm pretty good at running from it. Is that where your faith is? Let me plead with you this morning. My goal is not to shame you. It's to plead with you and say, would you give it up to God? Would you stop playing that game? Your name is not built to handle any sort of faith. It's exhausting. Because deep down, you know, I know, we all know we're vulnerable. We don't have it all together. There's always stuff that's just outside of our field of vision that we don't know is coming. But when you're placing your faith in someone who's broken, it's exhausting, it's terrifying. Would you place your faith in the God who holds it all in his hands? Because his word promises if you do, you will find rest and healing and refreshment this morning in whatever it is that you're going through. And so as we close this morning, we actually have a wonderful opportunity to stir up that faith and experience a time of refreshing, and that's by partaking in the Lord's Supper. So if you go ahead and grab those elements and start to get them ready. This is an amazing opportunity to reflect on what Jesus accomplished for us. And I just want you to think about these, these things. Um, I opened the wrong side of that. Make sure you open the bread first or else it's not gonna end well. But this is a great opportunity to reflect on what Christ has accomplished for us. Sit and think about the suffering that he willfully chose. And it's, this is just my little rabbit trail. It's so much more than literal physical pain on the cross. None of us can imagine what it's like to bear the sins of the world. And I go as far to say as that was more painful, more hard for Christ to endure than any sort of physical pain on the cross. Yeah, he did. First and foremost, for the glory of God, but secondly, for love for you and me. The man and the woman on the side of the road who wanted nothing to do with him. So as you reflect on that, it, it, like I don't know how that can't stir up your faith and your love for him to stir your affections for, hey, God did so much for me. I, it's not like, hey, I'm gonna do a lot for him. It's just, I'm gonna rest in my love for him because of what he's done. As we reflect, ask yourself those questions I mentioned just a moment ago. Where are you placing your faith today? Where is it? Is there an area of your life where you need to invite him in? You need to lay down your desires for his will you need to die to self and pick up your cross. Maybe you just need to take time to pray and ask for faith. God loves to give faith as a gift. And so I'm just gonna give you a few moments to reflect, to pray, to, to get your heart right with the Lord. Like I said earlier, we don't wanna take this in an unworthy manner. If there's sin that you need to confess, I'll just take the time to do that now. And then we'll partake. As you pray and reflect, if you need some help, ask yourself, how often do I pray? How often do I spend time in the word? Because often those two things are very, very good indicators of who you're placing your trust and your faith in. Take the bread, Let's go ahead and dwell on the fact this is Christ's body broken for us, broken for our sin. Matthew 26, 26 says, now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Go ahead and prepare the cup. And as you do dwell on this, that because of Jesus's blood that was spilled, we have a victory. We have freedom over sin. 
that there is, because of Jesus's blood, that there is power, healing, life, refreshment in his name available to us today. Let that bring you joy. We sometimes focus on, on the, 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 the cross and we lose focus of the life on the other side of it, if that makes sense. Let your heart just be overjoyed by the life on the other side of the cross, that that grave didn't stay empty. Verse 27 says, and he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So here in just a moment, we're gonna take an opportunity to sing we're gonna sing a song of praise, we're gonna respond. And if the Lord has been moving in your heart, if you felt conviction, whatever it may be, don't run from it this morning. Would you take this opportunity this morning to just remove yourself from what's going on in five minutes? Your growth group, your, your lunch this afternoon, that'll be there when you get back. But just take this time, the next two, three minutes. Would you rest in the presence of the Lord? Would you give it to him? Whatever that is that you're going through, whatever life is throwing at you right now, I don't know what it is, but would you give it to him who can hold it in his hand? Would you give it to him who's in control anyways? However the Lord is leading you, please be obedient and respond.